In this first video of our plants unit, we'll dis discuss the transports uh, specifically of water in a structure in plants called the xylem. And this is for IB section 9.1 for exam material starting in 2016. And transport in the xylem is all primarily based off of this process called transpiration. And that is the loss of water vapor from leaves and stems of plants. And this occurs due to a variety of different reasons that we'll look at here in a second, but oftentimes uh, evaporation of the water due to temperature, for example, would be a cause of that. And the plant leaves are really important, obviously, for plants because they're the primary organ of where photosynthesis takes place. And water actually is lost through the leaves. Uh, believe it or not, it's basically impossible to be able to see these with the naked eye, but the plant has small holes inside of it, uh, the leaves do, uh, within the cells that allows CO2 to be absorbed in. Well, water can also be lost through these hole holes, uh, which is kind of a problem. And, and so um, through this process, um, the amount of water can be minimized um, using something called a guard cell that we'll take a look at here as well. And so this process of transpiration also helps us to be able to understand and explain how water is able to essentially defy gravity and move vertically up through the plant. Um, and it's all due to transpiration, as we'll see. To begin with, there are some different factors that affect the rate of transpiration. And the first is humidity. If there is a lot of humidity or if humidity is high, it's going to be a slow rate of diffusion. So the water is going to be, um, the, the rate of, of diffusion off of the leaves and evaporation is going to be much slower. And so uh, high humidity causes a non-steep concentration gradient between the interior and exterior of the leaf. And so the diffusion or loss of water occurs more slowly. Wind can also affect the rate of transpiration. Wind blows away water vapor that collects near the stomata of the leaves, ensuring a high concentrated creation concentration gradient, excuse me, due to the lack of water by the stomata, this increases the rate of, of transpiration. So wind moving that water away actually increases the rate of transpiration. CO2 um, can also affect the rate of transpiration. The stomata open and close based on the concentration of CO2, so a high CO2 results in the, st the stomata uh, closing and lowering the overall uh, rate of transpiration. The last two sunlights uh, if sunlight is open, the guard cells, which control the opening and closing of the stomata, the holes in the leaf tissue. Um, and so if there's sunlight present, the cells open to allow the intake of CO2 for photosynthesis, which then would allow for water to, to evaporate. And temperature can also cause changes. Uh, higher temperature causes evaporation faster, um, and then thus increasing the rate of transpiration. Those uh, Going back to sunlight, those guard cells being open and CO2 being brought in, it's also going to increase the rate of transpiration because water is going to be lost faster. Let's take a closer look at the guard cells here. The opening is the stomata, and this is found in the leaf uh, cells. And this is where the CO2 can enter or leave the cell, as well as water. And what controls the stomata from opening or, or being closed is these guard cells. And there's so, uh, there cells that surround this opening. And the, they can regulate, the guard cells can regulate transcription by opening or closing, which would allow water to move in or out. And they do so by using trigger pressure. When the guard cells are filled with water, they bulge like, like so, um, which causes the stomata to open. When they lack water, they become flaccid and they shut together. The plant hormone abscisic acid causes the closing of the stomata that helps to control or to regulate uh, the rate of transcription. And so now that we have an understanding of how water is actually evaporating and different things that can affect the rate of transcription, let's look more specifically at water moving through the xylem, through the uh, structure of the plant. And this starts all the way from the roots of the, of the plants. Water flows from the soil past the epidermis, which is the outer lining of the plant root, and then it moves past the root cortex, past the endoderm endodermis and to the xylem. And the xylem is the structure that we're really focusing on um, and it is how water is being moved through the plant. And that occurs through a process of osmosis, which we'll look at a little bit further. Before we get to that though, let's talk a little bit about the xylem vessel. Um, obviously water moves to the xylem within the plant and they are long hollow cells um, that have some living content and some non-living content 
uh, that living content from the initial cell is broken down and turned into a, a sap which thickens the cell walls of the lumen of the xylem and that those cell walls are, are, are thickened with what's called lignin and that helps to strengthen the xylem and allows it to withstand the negative pressure and the different pressures that are occurring during, during the process of transpiration. Pores along the outer cellulose of the cell wall allow water to be moved between the xylem and adjacent leaf cells. And this is really important when we're looking at the movement of sugar throughout the plant. And we'll talk about the use of water to help that to be able to occur. There's no plasma membrane uh, present in mature xylem cells. They're actually not alive. They've, uh, once they've grown and, and are, are functional, they actually die. And it allows water to move in and out freely because there's no plasma membrane. Um, so it's just the rigid structure of the former cell. Um, and because of this, they're able to withstand low, low pressure. And so I keep talking about pressure and osmosis a little bit. Let's look at how this actually occurs. So if you remember back to diffusion, um, osmosis, when we talked about earlier in the year or previous videos, um, molecules move tend to want to move from areas of high concentration to low concentration. And so keeping that in mind, water evaporates out of the stomata on the leaves. And so water actually leaves out of these leaves. That process is called transpiration. When that happens, it creates areas of low concentration of water. So water is drawn by adhesion through the cell wall from the xylem to replace this water. So when the water evaporates here, more water is taken up from the xylem in the stem uh, molecules here, or as seen here, right, right here, the kind of tan color, water gets pulled from the xylem as it evaporates from the stomata. The force of adhesion between water and the cell walls is strong enough to suck water out of the xylem. So that, that, that force is strong enough to pull the water out of the xylem. The low pressure generates a pulling force that gets transmitted through the xylem and pulls water upwards against gravity. So this adhesion and even cohesion pulls that water up the xylem, all because water's being evaporated out of the stomata. There's no energy that's required for all of this to occur, and it's all possible because of the heat or wind or whatever the factor may be that causes the water to evaporate from the leaves or to leave the leaves. And the low pressure uh, generates this pulling force through the xylem, which then pulls the water upwards. Water is replaced from water that's leaving the plant from the stomata here by water from the xylem, which is collected from the soil by the different root tissue. And so if you want to go back to it and think of it in terms of a high concentration, low concentration, water is evaporating from the stomata here, creating a low concentration. There's a higher concentration of, of water in the soil and the roots specifically. And so then that adhesion, cohesion force pulls water upwards against gravity and out in order to be able to replace it because it's moving from high to low. Um, it's really pretty cool that the plants are able to do this and to defy gravity and it allows those plants, uh, allows plants to be able to photosynthesize which obviously we know is really important. Not only do plants take water from the soil, they also take minerals and ions. And plants absorb water mineral ions through their root tissue as well. Um, there's increased surface area in relation to their volume to help them be able to absorb more. And obviously this increases the absorption rate. Um, and let's take a closer look at these here. So here we've got some soil particles. Here's a root hair. And then uh, here, this is would be an individual cell. And then this would be a second cell here. The concentration of minerals and ions within the root hair uh, is actually higher than what it is in the soil. Uh, it can oftentimes be 100 times greater inside of the root tissue than in the soil. And this is established by active transport. So the cells, uh, the plant spends energy in the form of ATP in order to pump or move these ions inside. There's separate pumps for each of the different type of ions to be able to control how much goes in or out. And what this also does is it causes osmosis of water into the root because the, if there's a high concentration of ions, minerals and ions inside of the root tissue, then water is going to move from areas of low concentration, uh, high concentration, excuse me, to low concentration. Plants also have a unique mutualistic relationship with hyphae, um, which allows um, ions, because ions move very slowly through the soil, um, this thread-like hyphae uh, grows in soil to absorb those mineral ions. It supplies to the, um, the ions to the roots of the plant, 
um, by this hyphae fungus. The fungus receives sugars and other nutrients from the plants in exchange, which is another example of a mutualistic relationship. So how this actually works is the concentration is, uh, of minerals inside of the plant is higher than that in the soil, as we previously said, and the, the plants keep a reserve of the ions. And again, use ATP to absorb more ions between the soil and the root hairs. And so active transport movement from low concentration, um, low concentration to high concentration is requiring energy in the form of ATP. Now, the root hairs help to increase the surface area for absorption. Um, the minerals absorbed are, are highly selective, and those more useful are absorbed first, obviously. Active tra transport pumps in root hair cells, um, active transport pumps in the root hair cells pump in ions, and there's lots of mitochondria in these cells in order to provide the energy. Now, some plants live in environments that are, make it much more difficult to be able to, to survive, and xerophytes are plant species with adaptations that help them to be able to survive in areas that are very arid um, or desert-like without a lot of rainfall. And they have some specific adaptations that help them to be able to do this. And the first, would be an, uh, first example would be something called a hairy stomata. And this is um, the stomata that's located in pits. Um, that's surrounded by hairs. And the pit helps to trap moist air and it reduces the rate of diffusion and reflects sunlight. So it helps less water to be evaporated as quickly. They also have water storage. Um, water storage tissue is present in the leaves and thick stems help to provide water storage and vertical stems help to avoid midday sun. Another example would be reduced and rolled leaves. Uh, the rolling or the folding of, of leaf cells in low water conditions um, causes them to be, when there's a low amount of water, causes them to be flaccid and reduces the area in which transpiration can occur. And usually these types of species have small leaves, thick leaves, or spines, or sometimes no leaves at all in some situations. A final example that uh, we want to look at is something called cam plants. In cam plants, the stomata open during the night instead of the day to avoid significant water loss due to the heat of the uh, heat of the day. And so in looking at an image of this here, um, during the night the stomata open up, CO2 has been able to be taken in. During the day the stomata close and so they're using just the light energy. And so during the day these plants are performing the light dependent reactions. At night they're performing the light um, independent reactions when CO2 is needed to be able to make sugar. Um, so this would be a separation of those, those different steps. C4 plants, on the other hand, are plants that have, um, have some adaptations that allow them to take in CO2 very quickly, and it's transported directly to uh, the rubisco in order to be able to begin the light uh, independent reactions to make sugar. The last topic that we'll take a look at is adaptations of uh, halophytes, and those are plants that, are, that have adaptations to live in um, water of, of high salinity or in areas of high salt. And so kind of somewhat similar to xerophytes, um, they have leaves that are small scaly structures or spines. Um, sometimes they'll shed their leaves when the water is scarce, uh, and the stem will take over photosynthesis. They have a thick cuticle. Uh, sunken stomata, long roots, and a structure to remove salt. And so there's different types of species that can live in uh, high salinity water, um, and these are called halophytes, and those are some of the different structures that they have to be able to survive in these different types of environments.